Hey guys, welcome to Plant Prescription, the Costa Farms podcast where we help educate, inspire, and teach you about plants by answering some of the most common questions we get in. Uh, as usual, I'm Justin, horticulturist here at Costa Farms, and this is Michelle, our IPM manager. Uh, we want to help you grow the healthiest, most vibrant plants possible. Um, so let's jump right in. How are you doing, Michelle? I am good. I'm doing much better than last week. No more flooding. I finally got my water back. Oh, it's such a relief. Last week we filmed this I, right after. It was a little chaotic. I am so glad to hear the weather is better there. Happily, the weather is better here too. We're no longer 100 degree temperatures. Oh, that's it's good. It's feeling, yeah, it's feeling like beautiful, beautiful late summer weather here on the West Coast. Oh, man. No rain? No rain yet, but, you know, it's coming. Our fall rains. Um, the weather forecast was saying that we have a 70% chance of a La Nina winter, which here in the Pacific Northwest is much wetter than usual. Uh huh. So fingers are crossed because we could really use it. Nice. Well, yeah, I hope so. Uh, do you want to jump in and uh, answer some plant questions? Talk about plants today? Let's do it. I am ready. Plants, uh, bugs too. For those of you who can't see, I've got my bug theme on today. So, or insects. Ugh. Insects, not bugs. We'll get into that another day. Anyway, take it away, Justin. All righty. You are rocking the bugs. Uh, <laughs> question number one. How do I keep the leaf edges from my begonia maculata from turning brown? This is from Judy in Bloomington, Indiana. Hmm. Well, I've done it. Have you done it, Justin? Have you had begonia maculata leaves turn brown? Oh, yeah. I have on multiple occasions. And I've had it happen for two different reasons. Reason number one, which was entirely on me and I knew it was going to happen. I still did it anyway. Uh, I had to put some of my begonias outside because I ran out of space and I put my plant outside. It got just a little bit of sun and that was all it took. It just browned the leaves out. So maybe, maybe it could be like I did where I burned my plant with sun that wasn't used to getting sun. Yeah, well, Begonia maculata does like bright light, um, especially in Southern climates, direct afternoon sun can cause some unsightly sunburn. Unsightly, yes, very much so. Uh, is that how you burned yours, Justin? Um, no, mine mine was from inconsistent watering. Ah. Uh, sometime I, I might just get a little busy here at work and I, I potentially don't give my indoor plants as much attention as, as they deserve. Mm -hmm. Um, and so making sure that you're consistent on the watering because unfortunately both too much and not enough water can cause the leaf edges to go brown and crispy. <laughs> um, it's like the fertilizer topic all over again. You can, exactly. you can burn it with too much water. You can burn it with too little water, but, uh, I did the same thing. Uh, so I burned a lot of maculatas. I really, I promise I'm not a horrible plant mom, but it happens. And I burned them twice with the sun and then the water. I just let them go bone dry. I mean like bone dry and they seem fine. But a couple of weeks later, whoo, you could tell they, I took it, I took it too far. <laughs> To anybody like Michelle who has killed a lot of plants, um, you know, it it may feel like that's a bad thing, but really that should be a badge of honor. Um, you know, our plant hunter here at, at Costa talks about how many plants he's killed and, and that being a good thing because you're learning their tolerances. You know exactly how far you can go. You know, yeah. here's the line between, yep, this plant will recover and nope, this plant will not recover. So yeah. absolutely embrace your experience as a, okay, you know, I've learned this. Yeah. I remember when I first started as uh, in growing, one of the growers who had been around for a while, uh, he gave me a piece of advice, which was in order to be a good grower, you've got to kill a few plants first. And I thought that was the cutest, like cutest, cutest, <laughs> cutest, coolest, combine those to coolest thing ever. I'm just curious uh, if you're going to combine coolest and cruelest. <laughs> well, it is though. It's really counterintuitive, but it's very true. And you know what? <clears throat> For the record, I have not killed a lot of plants. That was a bit of an exaggeration. I've killed a couple handfuls. <laughs> um, and, you know, circling back to Judy's question now, um, Begonia maculata has really thin leaves. Um, you know, if you feel it in your hand, and especially if you compare it to something like a pothos or a ZZ plant, 
you know, thin leaves are also much more susceptible to drying out from drafts. So if it's near a heating vent, an air conditioning vent, another source of air that's noticeably different than the ambient air, that can also cause those those leaves to brown a little, qu- a little quicker than you'd like them to. Yeah, you know, I never uh, relative, thought about that. Relative humidity also can play a part. Um, happily, Indiana is not too arid of a climate. Uh, but um, in winter, for example, uh, if you're running your furnace, those those uh, humidity levels can drop down. And if the air gets too dry for this tropical, you might also see. Krispies. Krispies. Leaf Krispies, not rice. Not Leaf rice Krispies. Krispies. <laughs> that, we can make that a shirt. Leaf Krispies. Uh all right. Well, I, I mean, the only two I had was water and sun. I mean, it's a no brainer. I know better. I've talked about it. Don't put your plant in sun if it's not supposed to be in sun. Uh, anyway, so what's next, Justin? All right. Question two. This one is from Marcos in Kendall, Florida. Um, so I heard you guys talking about beneficial insects, but why would I want to bring more bugs into my home? Or why do you guys want to bring more bugs into your greenhouses? Ah, oh, thank you so much, Marcos and Kendall, Miami. I really love the opportunity to kind of like break down the stigma associated with bugs and plants. Um, it's one of the more natural things that exists out there. I mean, when you look at the evolutionary history of plants and bugs for that matter, they literally evolved together. They're like peanut butter and jelly. And these plants developed flowers for bugs. Like Yeah, there's that famous story of Char- Charles Darwin and the moth where wait, he found a what? I don't know this story. So 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 Darwin found a moth um that has just this obnoxiously long for the for the size of the moth uh fibiscus. Um and he said, you know, there has to be a flower that has a tube that long because there's no reason that evolutionarily this moth would have a fibiscus this long. Um, and of course, you know, as of the time, people laughed at him. And uh-huh. then they found the flower, and the moth is the pollinator for that flower. The length matches, and you know, it, it's hand in hand, exactly what you're saying. Isn't that wild? That's so cool. Another really fun, we're talking about evolution. We'll get off it for a second, but one last really cool evolutionary um, uh, story of bugs, insects, because insects and plants is um, the. Emmaphrophallus, which is one of my favorite plants that I actually like collect all the species. Emmaphrophallus is the corpse flower. Um, And, you know, we have many, many beautiful, very fragrant, lovely smelling flowers. And then you have the corpse flower, which evolved and smells like rotting carrion to attract a different pollinator. Um, it was, I think it evolved. It, there's a lot of species. Some of them evolved in the rainforest. Some of them evolved, you know, in the highlands, yada, yada, yada. But uh, all of them evolved to uh, to draw in like another insect, a different insect for pollination. Side note, I had one go into flower when I was in college, living in an apartment in the middle of winter, New York, and it smelled horrendous. Um, but I love my plants and I don't kill all the plants if I can avoid it. So I actually had to leave my apartment for a week uh, while it smelled. But it's a really cool story about evolution and insects and how they like plants and insects evolve together. So this is natural. This is this is normal. And I think this mentality of the silent spring, I don't want any bugs on my plants. Well, that's just again, this is not natural. It's not, it's not how it is. You're going to have them coinciding and not all insects are bad. Um, the beneficial insects and beneficial insects are basically like an insect or a mite, which is not an insect, which we went over, uh, an insect or a mite that helps us in our goal. You know, um, and that's what makes them beneficial. So there's a couple of kinds. There's obviously we have the pollinators, which are beneficials because they help us in our goal to produce food. And then we also have other beneficials. So when you're talking about save the pollinators, you're not necessarily <laughs> talking about the flies on the amorphophallus, though. Well, flies are really cool, though. And I mean, hunter flies are a beneficial. So, yeah, save the flies. Well, Save out, save all the bugs except for thrips, mites, aphids, 
uh, melee bugs. Melee bugs. Well, you know, except for all those, but save, save all the bugs uh, and mites. And so anyway, uh, where was I? Uh, so pollinators, that's one kind of beneficial. And then obviously the beneficials that we're really focusing on and that I focus on a lot are the beneficial insects that are either predators or parasitoids, basically the, the beneficial insects that kill the pest insects or what we consider pests. You know, not every organism out there would consider thrips a pest. Some organisms like, you know, the mites and the lacewing, they think thrips are not a pest. They think thrips are food. And so for us, a pest, they, the beneficial insects help us. Um, and, you know, it, it's not like bad to add these to your house because oftentimes you're not even going to see them. So we've got a bunch of beneficial insects out there. Some of them are mites. So they're like super duper tiny. And I, there's a stigma of adding bugs. Like people are just imagining bugs crawling all over them. And that's not going to happen. They're not going to be crawling all over you. Unless of course you introduce adult lacewing, which I don't know if I would introduce adult lacewing into a house because adult lacewing aren't predators. We'll go over that maybe hopefully in another episode. Um, but, you know, that's one of the situations where, yeah, you may see them flying around because they're giant flying bugs. But most of the beneficials, but, yeah. And and in a case like that, it's also not not necessarily going to be a long-term relationship that you have with them. Because once the, once the pest that they eat is pretty much eradicated, there's no food. And so the, so the beneficials die out. Yeah, yeah. It's a sad, sad thing. But a lot of bugs and beneficials do starve, uh, which... <laughs> Maybe we won't get into in another episode because it's kind of sad and morbid to talk about. We're here to talk about happy bug things, not sad bug things. So happy bug things. Why use them? Um, Costa Farms, we we use in North Carolina, where I am, uh, quite a bit of beneficials um, for a lot of reasons. Um, and this could also apply to homeowners, although we'll maybe, maybe beneficials are right for you. Maybe they're not. We'll go over that after I tell you why they're good, just in general, why they're good. And then you can decide if they're good for you or not. So number one, why they're good. You can reduce chemical usage. That's a no brainer. Um, you are applying beneficials. So therefore you don't need as many insecticides. Uh, so that's great. It's great for you. It's great for health and safety of you. It's great for the health and safety of the environment. Um, and you know, as we try to be more sustainable, that kind of goes hand in hand with that mission of being sustainable is using less chemicals and using more beneficials. And sometimes I do wonder, I can't confirm this, but it, I do wonder, we do add a lot of beneficials to our greenhouse and to our production area. And I've seen them um, more and more every year. And I, it does make me wonder if in fact we are also adding more beneficials to our surrounding environment. Um, and don't worry, don't worry, we're not introducing anything new. These are all beneficials and insects and mites that have been tested and over years proven to not be uh, invasive by the USDA. Like they're not going to get out of control and just uh, disrupt our ecosystems. But it well, is and some of, of them are, are even native, aren't they? Uh, yeah, I, a lot of them are actually native. Uh, there's a uh, row of beetles, uh, lacewing honestly can be found in a lot of places as well. And the ones that are, may not be native, um, will die, uh, because they will freeze and die in the winter. And so there's no need to worry about anything that isn't native establishing because they're just, they won't survive. Um, so that's cool. Don't worry about that. But, you know, it is more sustainable. It's healthier. Um, another reason is resistance issues. So uh, the pests that you have on your plants. Uh, typically, the newer insecticides and the newer chemistry out there, it's it's really honed in on one kind of um, chemical pathway or, you know, something like that that's occurring inside of the insect or mite. And uh, this is really specific, which is very good because you don't want a very, very giant broad spectrum insecticide being applied and killing everything and, you know, DDT and all that jazz. Like that isn't the way to go. You want a specific chemistry. But as it is very specific to this pathway that, you know, this insect has, it could be easily 
um, overcome. So it could be just as simple as one gene or one allele. I think it's allele. It's been a while since I've done genetics. I promised yep, I have my nope, professor. You're right. I Good promised job. my professor I would never talk about it. And here I am on a podcast talking about genetics. <laughs> anyway, so, but basically it just takes one little tiny change in that insect's DNA to now be resistant to that chemical. And, you know, my friend Suzanne, who got me the shirt, who is awesome. She is the bug lady, like literally the bug lady. She has a really fun phrase where, you know, you can develop resistance to a chemical, um, but it's really hard to develop resistance to being eaten. And so it, <laughs> it's true. You it's can't, true, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to take a lot of years to develop that. And we're not going to see that happen overnight. And so it's a lot more effective in the fact that it's there. It's harder to build resistance. Um, another thing that I would argue just from personal experience is that using beneficials is easier. Um, they are literally evolved to find the pest for you. Like they can, sometimes they'll know it's there before you do, which is great. And it's a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, an IPM integrated pest management, a lot of the practices, we're not putting, um, beneficials out to cure a problem. Although there are a couple that have the capacity to do that. Most of the time you're putting them out to prevent a problem. Um, and this is because they're very good at finding these things. I've, we've had beneficials. We've had, um, aphidious, uh, wasps in the greenhouse go and they find aphids and they just kill the aphids before we even see them. And it's only later that we see that the aphids are dead and they were there. We're like, huh, good job. You did a great job finding those because that's what they're evolved to do. We're talking a lot about evolution in this podcast today. Um, okay. So I feel so smart. I, right. Uh, I hope I got my years right. Cause evolution is like millions and billions and you could really, really, really mess that up. But anyway, um, so another reason that they're easier is, you know, if you're uh, if you're a houseplant enthusiast like yours truly, and you have a lot of, let's say, spider mites, um, and spider mites, like we said in the last episode, tend to hang out on the undersides of the leaves. Going and applying a chemical or a horticultural oil to eat and flipping each leaf and applying the oil to each underside of each leaf is really time consuming and very difficult and you're not guaranteed coverage. And the great thing about beneficials, what makes it easier is that you don't have to flip the leaves. They'll go and they'll find it and they'll walk around and they'll do that for you. Um, it's just easier in my opinion. Um, it's also and, easier in that. Oh, sorry. Nope. In that you'll, you, you only have to apply in a lot of cases, your beneficials once, whereas going back to the spider mite example, um, if you're going to use something like neem oil, you have to use that twice a week for for several weeks to start to build up enough control because they reproduce so fast. That's a really good point, Justin. That's really good. I like that. I'm going to use that too. I didn't think of that, but that's true. Well, in a greenhouse setting, in like a large scale production, you have to apply them more because we're using preventative measures. Um, but yeah, in, in the case of spider mites. For the plant mites, parents out there. Yeah. In the case of spider mites, yeah, it's. It's one and done. But oh, while we're on the topic of that, I did want to make a little anecdote. You know, persimilis are fantastic for two spotted spider mite. And we were, I, not we, I was mostly focused on two spotted spider mite. But there are other species of spider mites out there. Um, and uh, different mites may be more compatible with those, like Phalasis or Californicus. So before you go and do persimilis and do an application, I just want everybody to be super successful with using beneficials. Just try. Try your darn bestest to identify which mites you have. Remember, the little poo spots <laughs> are the two spotted spider mites. And if you have those, that's where the persimilis are really going to shine. Let's just remember the poo spots, the poo saddlebags. Okay, so um, another, another reason why beneficials are awesome and why you should use them is they're not only safer on you and the environment, um, they're also safer on your plants. Uh, a lot of chemicals, um, another thing I forgot to mention is that when we were talking about oil and neem oil, oil can be dangerous on plants. Um, as we recommended and we always recommend, follow the label on uh, each each oil, each chemical, every fertilizer, everything that you use, follow the label. Um, because some oils can burn plants. And phytotoxicity is either a burn or it can kill your plant. It's basically a chemical that hits your plant and it does not do well with the plant. Um, I think 
you know, I've never experienced it, but I have heard that oils can harm ferns and like fuzzy plants. Oils can really not do well on those. I don't have experience with that. Do you, Justin? I do. So I collect passiflora. Yeah. Um, and yeah, neem oil, I have burned many a passiflora. I have completely defoliated uh, one back when, back when I lived in Iowa, um, trying to get spider mites off of it. Ah, oh, sad. So, but hey, you had no, no more spider mites. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the bright side. But yeah, to that, to that extent, it, not even oils, insecticides too. Some insecticides are not labeled for certain plants and they can cause damage. So using a beneficial or another insect or mite is going to be good because they're not going to feed on your plant. What makes them beneficials is they're not going to hurt your plant. They're just going to go after your pests. Um, you're not going to see them feeding and causing more damage on your plant. That's They're not going to do that. And they're safe. They won't burn it. They're going to help it. They're like your little soldiers on the ground. Um, <laughs> so, okay. So those are the reasons. Do you have any more reasons why, Justin? I'm curious. No, that's, yeah, for me, it really comes down to it's, it's easier for me. Yeah, me too. Definitely. And it, it works. Um, now that being said, um, and you know, a large scale greenhouse production, hands down, they work. They're, they're really good. They're really effective. Um, they're sustainable. They're a great way to go. But if you are a homeowner and you're considering using beneficials and you're listening to us and you're going, wow, that sounds great. Like I don't want to flip leaves because it's really hard to flip all those leaves. Um, if you have a couple of houseplants, you may be better off doing that method. So question number one, like to decide if this is a good route for you, uh, do you have a lot of plants or is it just easier to spray your plants? You know, like we were talking about both Justin and I have a lot of plants. Justin has a greenhouse too, which I'm very jealous about. Uh, so, but we both have a lot of plants and for us to go and spray each plant, it's just way too much work. And most of our plants, my, most of mine are touching. Um, and so if I were to apply mites, I wouldn't have to go plant by plant even. I could just apply it and, uh, you know, give them five feet, not even. I mean, you are you don't have a – it's not that hard to put a lot. But, go, you know, every one foot or however often you want, um, and they'll travel. And so reason, question number one, do you have a lot of plants or is it just a few plants? A lot of plants, you may want to try beneficials. Um, and then question number two – it's very, very important. And I would love to kind of de dive into this a little bit more in other episodes. What pest are you targeting? Um, because pest ID is very, 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 very important when it comes to IPM and using beneficials. Uh, because, yeah, you could buy, um, I don't know, uh, aphidius colomani for your plants, but if your plants have mites and aphidias goes after aphids, they're not going to do anything. Um, so you really, really need to match up your beneficial with your like target with your pest. And that's really important. Some pests out there, unfortunately, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but some pests are not as easy to control with beneficials and some pests you honestly may be better off doing the chemical method. Um, so it really does depend on the pest. Um, and then question number three that I would ask when you're thinking about using beneficials in your house is how bad is your problem? Um, are your plants on the brink of death or are you seeing just spotty damage here and there? Um, because the, there are, the parasimilis is very fast when it comes to two spotted spider mites, but as a rule of thumb, most of the other beneficials do take a while to work. And so if your plant's almost dead, uh, you may not want to wait for uh, the beneficials to really kind of take off and knock those things down. So those are the three questions I would ask yourself. Do you have a lot of plants? What pests are you targeting? And how bad is your problem? Um, but if all of you check all the boxes and all of those and you want to try them, I would highly recommend it. For the record, I don't have anything against using chemicals. Chemicals are fantastic um, in certain situations, but I'm just trying to encourage everyone to kind of open up their minds a little bit more and get away from the stigma of all insects are bad and just get a little curious. And next time you see a bug, instead of smushing it, I know a lot of people out there who do that, instead of just smushing it, ask, what is this bug? Is it helping me? Because you could unknowingly be killing 
good books and you wouldn't want to do that. Good That's point. all I have for that. Just love your bugs. Try not to kill them all. So I hope you guys found that to be thought provoking. Um, definitely let us know um, what, what your thoughts are, you know, drop us an email, let us know in the comments. If you're watching this on YouTube, um, love to love to hear your thoughts. Absolutely. Yes, please. I'm always curious because I clearly have a mindset where I love bugs. My nickname with my family is bug. Uh, but so it's hard for me to see why people don't love bugs. So please, please explain why. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Justin. All right. Ne next question. Uh, this one comes from Sarah in Bozeman, Montana. I have an anthurium, but it doesn't seem happy. What do I need to do for it? Uh, <laughs> um, you know, and you know, this is, we, we get this kind of question a lot. Um, and in all honesty, this is a really difficult question to answer, uh, because it doesn't give us a lot of specifics to go off of. Um, you know, when you, when you ask for, for help, um, it's really, it's really helpful to us to have, um, a little more idea about symptomology. You know, does not mean, does does not looking happy mean it's not blooming? Does it mean it's wilting? Does it mean the the leaves are are, are showing some kind of symptoms of something? Uh, yeah. But in general, for, for flowering anthuriums, um, I would suggest uh, putting them in a bright spot with indirect light. Um, as with pretty much any house plant, it appreciates lots and lots of indirect light. Um, it'll be happiest there. Because uh, inside, our homes just don't have the kind of light like even the, the rainforest floor does, unless it's right up by a window. Oh, wow. I never thought about that. The rainforest floor has more light than my house? <laughs> okay. That's interesting. I'm sorry. Go on, Justin. Um, another thing with, with anthuriums are, are warm temperatures. You know, they really appreciate uh, warm but not hot conditions inside. Um, and so if it's, if it's been in the, the fifties or if it's been staying like in the nineties, your anthurium just, it might not be happy because of the, the environmental conditions. Yep. Yep. I would say I, from my experience, um, with anthuriums, they like a loose potting mix from what I've seen. Um, and so if you have an anthurium that you've repotted into a denser mix, Maybe take a look and pop that out and look at the roots and see if they're like black and squishy um, and if there's a smell to it too. You may um, have a root issue as well. Uh, so like that chunky, well-draining soil mix, what is what I found is best for anthuriums. Also don't want to underwater it either. You know, <laughs> like, uh, like, like Goldilocks, you know, plants have this just right between too much and not enough water. Here we go again. <laughs> yeah, very true, though. And then circling back to what we were talking about with begonia maculata, also want to make sure that it's it's not um, in in a, in a draft, you know, where it's getting hot or cold air blown on it, uh, because that can really mess with plants. If you think about where they where they naturally evolve from, you know, we don't have situations in nature where you know the 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 plant is is growing happily and then all of a sudden out of nowhere you know, a blast of, of hot, dry furnace air hits it, you know? And so it's just plants aren't used to it. That would be wild. Sit out there in the middle of the winter and all of a sudden, boom. Oh, thank God. The furnace air hit furnace winds. All right. So, 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 so Sarah, try to make sure that it's getting good light. It's getting enough, but not too much water. Um, it's not exposed to drafts. Um, and, and we hope that helps your anthurium if, oh, oh, Michelle has a thought. Ooh, I don't know why I didn't think of this. Check for pests. Uh, duh. <laughs> like literally talking about bugs and unhappy plants. I'm sorry. I just, they came out of left field, like the furnace wind. Um, so check the undersides and check your plants for bugs. Um, not all of them are going to be on the under underside of the leaves. A good chunk of them are, but just look. And if you see little chew marks, little scrape marks, little, um, like yellowing pinprick spots or like really bugs, which are white. I don't know, but you may white, like white, um, fluffy, waxy cotton balls. cotton balls. Thank you. I was struggling there. If you see those, that could also be the issue too. So check for pests. 
So we hope that helps you, Sarah. Um, if not, right back in with a little more specifics and uh, we'll we'll do what we can to get you an answer. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully it's nothing. It's nothing uh, catastrophic. Hopefully it's just a matter of shifting something here or there. All right, so we have gone over all of the questions, correct, Justin? Correct. All right, so are we going to do another misconception today? Um, sure. All right, so um, another another piece of advice that you tend to hear a lot um, is when you're repotting a plant uh, that you should put gravel or some kind of layer of something in the bottom to help with drainage. I mean, and, hmm. oh, go on. But uh, you were gonna say I want you to say it first. Oh, I, you know, I, I was actually just talking to a, a close friend about this uh, uh -huh. the other day, um, and it makes like it sounds like it makes so much sense. If yeah. you have this layer of something at the bottom, there's a place where it can trap water, um, so that your your soil doesn't get swamped with it. Right. Um, but the 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 unrealistic part about that is that gravel or or other things that you're you're making this layer of they're not impermeable you know and so soil is going to filter down in between the particles and soil's like a sponge right and so this the 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 soil that that filters down in between these channels between the individual pieces of gravel it's going to be sitting in the water that sits down there um and it's going to be sucking it up it's and going to it's have going a wick be, action yeah it's going to exactly. be wicking yep now, a uh, theoretical question. We are talking about gravel in the bottom of pots that do not have drain holes. You know, I hear that advice being given even with pots with drainage. Huh. I mean, Which makes it, it wouldn't hurt. It's not going to like hurt your plant if it has a drain hole to put uh, gravel or rocks on the bottom of it. But you're not you don't need it. And in fact, taking away space for roots could be um, less advantageous than just, you know, leaving the soil down there. As long as you have a drain hole. Um, I, I, I guess if a plant doesn't have a drain hole, I, you know, you just got to be really careful with your watering. Yeah. But like Justin said, gravel isn't going to be the cure-all. You know, another really fun, fun thing to, to kind of try to, to, to illustrate why um, it's not necessarily the best idea to do this is to take a rectangular sponge, like a kitchen sponge, um, soak it in water, and then hold it up so it's kind of on the flat side um, until the water starts dripping out, right? Okay, yeah. And then when the water's no dripping, um, turn it on the short side, and because there's a little more gravity action, you're going to see some water drip out of it that wasn't dripping when it was laying flat because you had um, a thinner profile. And then yep. when you tip it long side, even more water is going to drip out because again, you have more gravity action. Mm -hmm. You know, that same thing is happening in your, in your potting mix. <laughs> the taller your soil profile, the better it's going to be pulling down. And Look if you us. tend to be somebody who overwaters a little bit, then, you know, could make a difference in how quickly the the you know the the water filters through and down out of the pot. Look at us talking genetics and evolution and physics today. Didn't think we were going to be this smart, did you? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> oh, well, that's a good point, Justin. I you know I it doesn't hurt, but I don't I don't really think that there's a need to do it. All righty. Anything, uh, anything you want to share and talk about before we wrap up for the week, Michelle? No, I don't have anything else. Just another call to arms. Please, 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 please just open your mind up to ditching the stigma of not all insects are bad and just, just start to be a little curious, let your inner child out and just before you kill it, try challenge yourself to identify what it is. You'd be surprised. There's actually a lot of benefits a lot of insects out there that are actually beneficials. Uh, lightning bugs are also a beneficial. The larvae of lightning bugs are also beneficials. So you may be surprised what you learn. It's a whole buggy bug world out there. And um, hopefully we can talk a little bit more about it. Although I, I would be honored to later on. That's all I have. If though. you Thank have you, questions, Justin. just write in and ask, ask. We're, we're happy to talk about 
bugs and other plant problems um, on all of our future episodes. Absolutely. Yeah. And fungus too. <laughs> all right. This episode was sponsored by Begonia Maculata. Uh, Begonia Maculata, which can show some brown leaf edges if it gets uh, too dry or drafty. Um, fantastic, stunning house plant with wing shaped leaves showing silvery spots. Uh, perfect addition to any collection. Absolutely. I have three of them. <laughs> and that's a wrap. We hope you guys have a great week. Happy gardening from your friends at Costa Farms. Bye bye. <laughs>